Okay, so picture this. You're coming home after a crazy day and you turn on the TV and the news is saying that one of the most amazing things humans have ever done, well, some folks think it never happened at all. Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? Exactly. Welcome to Dance Flame, where we take these complicated topics and break them down for you. I'm Edward. And I'm Lily, super excited to dive into this one with you because today's deep dive tackles a question that just won't quit. Did the U.S. really land people on the moon? Right. You guys sent us a ton of stuff on this, from the arguments behind the conspiracy theories to all the evidence from NASA and scientists. So what's the mission today? Our mission is to wade through all this info, separate the moon rocks from the space dust, and try to give you a clearer view of this whole captivating controversy. Yeah. I mean, it really is captivating. You've got this awe-inspiring story of humans landing on another world, but then you've also got this mind-bending idea that it could all be a giant hoax. Yeah. So how do we even start to unpack this? Well, I think it helps to start with the version of events that most of us grew up with. July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 touches down. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin take those first steps. Michael Collins is orbiting up above. Right. That image is basically burned into everyone's minds. And then there were five more successful Apollo missions, 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17. The last one was in December of 72. A pretty iconic era. It really is. A high point for human ingenuity and courage. But then there's that other persistent narrative claiming it was all staged. And like you said, a lot of the early theories point to the Cold War space race. The pressure on the U.S. to beat the Soviets was immense, and some people thought faking a moon landing would be the ultimate victory. Yeah, it's fascinating how those two competing narratives have become so deeply ingrained. So hmm. let's dive into some of the specific conspiracy arguments that you probably came across in your research. One of the most visually compelling and often cited pieces of evidence is that American flags seemingly waving on the moon. What's the main argument there? I'm sure you saw this one too. The argument is pretty basic. Flags don't wave in a vacuum. The moon has no atmosphere, no wind. So a waving flag in the pictures and videos must mean there's wind implying that they were filmed somewhere on Earth. Seems pretty logical at first glance, right? Yeah, it does. But the counter argument is actually a really neat piece of engineering. The flag wasn't just any ordinary flag. It was designed for the moon. It had a telescopic pole across the top to make it look unfurled even without any wind. Oh, I didn't realize that. It's a detail that often gets overlooked. And when the astronauts planted the flag twisting the pole into the lunar soil, that motion created inertia. Inertia is the tendency of an object to resist changes in its motion. Now, on Earth, air resistance would dampen that movement. But on the moon, with no air, that initial swinging continued for much longer, giving the illusion of waving. Huh. So it's kind of like a slow motion ripple effect. Exactly. And what's interesting is that in later footage, once the astronauts let go of the flag, it stayed perfectly still. So what looks like evidence for a hoax is actually evidence of the careful planning that went into accounting for the unique lunar environment. That makes so much sense. Okay, so what about those missing stars in the moon photos? Shouldn't the lunar sky be full of them? It's a totally valid question. Here on Earth, we don't see stars during the day because our atmosphere scatters the sunlight. But the moon has practically no atmosphere, so you'd think you'd see stars everywhere in those pictures. Ah. So the conspiracy theory claims this is proof that the landings were filmed in a studio with a black backdrop. So why are those iconic photos missing stars then? It comes down to how cameras work. The lunar surface is super bright, lit by direct sunlight. To get clear photos of the astronauts and the landscape, the cameras needed to use really fast shutter speeds. Think about taking a picture on a sunny day here on Earth. You have to adjust your camera settings so everything isn't too bright. Those fast shutter speeds didn't let enough light in to capture the faint stars. Oh, so it's like how you don't see stars in your daytime photos. Exactly. To catch the faint light from stars, they would have needed much longer exposures, and that would have washed out the whole lunar surface and the astronauts, everything would just be a bright blur. So they had to prioritize capturing the mission and the astronauts clearly. It makes you wonder what would have been the point of capturing blurry stars when the whole purpose of the mission was to document the astronauts in the lunar landscape. Right. It wasn't an astronomy mission. It was about getting there, exploring, and documenting everything. Now, what about the shadows? Some of those photos show them going in different directions. Yeah, this is a classic example of how a two-dimensional image can be misleading. The conspiracy theory says that the shadows being inconsistent, like different lengths and pointing in different directions, means there must have been multiple light sources. And that wouldn't be possible on the moon with only the sun. So they say it must have been studio lighting. Okay, so what's the real explanation then? 
Well, the moon's surface isn't flat. It's covered in craters, hills, and rocks. And those changes in elevation make the shadows look different when you see them in a photograph. It's like when you're standing on a hill here on Earth, your shadow might look different from someone else's shadow nearby just because the ground is sloping. I see. Plus, they were using wide-angle lenses to capture those big panoramic shots, and those lenses can distort perspective, making parallel lines look like they're not. Oh, so our brains are basically trying to make sense of a 3D scene from a flat photo. Exactly, and it's being messed up by these optical effects. But when you do a detailed analysis using trigonometry and taking into account the landscape of the landing sites, it all lines up with the sun being the only light source. Oh, wow. And you also have to consider that sunlight reflects off the lunar surface that can soften the edges of shadows and make them seem even weirder. Okay, so it's not studio lighting, just the moon playing tricks on our eyes. Yeah. All right, what else did those conspiracy theories say? Oh, there's the one about the Van Allen radiation belts. Right, the idea that the, the radiation in those belts would have been lethal to the astronauts. Exactly. Those belts are these zones of charged particles surrounding Earth, and they do have intense radiation. The conspiracy theory says that in the 1960s, they couldn't have shielded the spacecraft from that radiation. So how did the Apollo missions deal with that? They were planned really, really carefully to minimize the astronauts' exposure. They flew through the outer edges of the belts where the radiation is weaker, and they did it super fast, only about an hour each way. And the command module was built with aluminum, which provided some shielding. Plus, the astronauts wore dosimeters to track how much radiation they were exposed to. Oh, smart. And the data from those dosimeters shows that they only received about one rad of radiation, which is way below dangerous levels. NASA did a ton of research and their calculations together with the health records of the Apollo astronauts proved that that quick trip through the Van Allen belts wasn't a problem. It really highlights how important planning and risk management are for space travel. Yeah, totally. Now, shifting gears a bit, another claim is that the technology back then just wasn't good enough. People point to the Apollo guidance computer as an example, saying it had way less memory than even our phones today. Yeah, it's easy to be skeptical when you compare 1960s tech to what we have now. And it's true, the Apollo guidance computer only had 72 kilobytes of memory, which seems ridiculously small now. But you have to think about it in context. The Apollo program didn't just appear out of nowhere. It was built on all the things they learned from the Mercury and Gemini programs. Right, those are the earlier space programs. Exactly. The Saturn V rocket and the lunar module were the result of years and years of research development testing. The AGC was designed specifically for navigation and control during the mission, and it was supported by powerful computers back on Earth and hundreds of thousands of incredibly smart engineers, scientists, and technicians. So they were working together to make it all happen. They were a huge team, and they were able to do so much with what seems like basic technology by today's standards. It really shows how ingenuity and human effort can push boundaries. Absolutely. We've talked about some of the technical and visual stuff, but there's also the idea that the moon landing was faked for political reasons to win the space race and lift national morale during a tough time. Right. That political motivation is a big part of the conspiracy theories. The argument is that the U.S. was desperate to beat the Soviet Union, and with the Vietnam War going on, they needed a win. So they faked the moon landing to boost morale and show their strength. But wouldn't it have been super risky to fix something that big? It would have been way more risky than actually going to the moon. Think about how many people would have to be in on it and keep quiet. Not just people at NASA, but all the contractor scientists around the world, even the Soviets. They had their own technology, and they would love to expose the U.S. if they'd faked it. Yeah, the Soviets would have called them out for sure. For sure. And they never did. The fact that the Soviets acknowledged the Apollo landings is a huge piece of evidence. It just doesn't make sense that a rival superpower would stay silent if they knew it was all fake. So faking it would have been way harder and riskier than actually going to the moon. Mm. Okay, we've talked about the why not. Now let's talk about the why. Yes, the evidence that supports the moon landings. You sent us a lot of info about this. What do you think is the most solid proof? The moon rocks. They're the most concrete evidence. They brought back 382 kilograms of lunar material from those six Apollo missions. That's 842 pounds of rock. Wow, that's a lot of rocks. And these aren't just any rocks. They have special qualities that you don't find in Earth rocks. For example, they have a lot of helium-3, which is created when rocks are exposed to solar wind and cosmic rays for a long time. It's super rare here on Earth. And they also don't have any water-based minerals, which makes sense because the moon is really dry. More than 60 labs all over the world have studied these moon rocks, and they all agree they came from space. 
So there's no way those rocks are from Earth. Absolutely not. And there's no way they could have faked that amount of material with those specific qualities back in the 1960s. It's hard to argue with a literal piece of the moon. Hmm. Okay, what about those laser reflectors? Oh, those are so cool. And they're still working today. Apollo 11, 14, and 15 left these things called retro reflectors on the moon. They're arrays of prisms that reflect light back to its source. No matter which angle you shine a laser at them, it bounces straight back. Like a mirror. Yeah, kind of. Scientists use powerful lasers to shoot beams of light at these reflectors and measure how long it takes for the light to go to the moon and back. That lets them measure the distance between Earth and the moon really precisely down to the millimeter. And these reflectors are still working perfectly. Scientists use them today to do research on the moon and even to test Einstein's theory of relativity. Wow, so it's like we have these permanent science experiments on the moon. What about all the photos and videos from the missions? There's tons of documentation. We have more than 20,000 pictures and hundreds of hours of film and video. Think about the iconic footage of Neil Armstrong taking those first steps or the incredible shots from the lunar rover during Apollo 15. I can picture those perfectly. <laughs> With the technology they had in the 1960s, it would have been almost impossible to fake those visuals, especially the way the lunar dust behaves in low gravity and those sharp shadows you only get from a single light source. Plus, there's this theory that they faked the low gravity by filming in slow motion, but if you watch the footage, the physics just don't add up. So it's not slow motion. It's the real deal. Uh -huh. And it wasn't just NASA saying it happened, right? Other countries were watching too. Right. That's super important. The Soviet Union... Japan and even amateur radio operators across the globe track the Apollo missions using radar and radio signals. And like we said, the Soviets had the tech and the motivation to call out the U.S. if they were lying. They definitely wouldn't have kept quiet about that. Nope. The fact that they publicly acknowledge the landings is huge. It really strengthens the case. Okay. And we also have to consider the astronauts themselves and everyone who worked on the Apollo program. Totally. Twelve people walked on the moon and their stories have been consistent for over 50 years. Plus, there are more than 400,000 people working on the Apollo program. If it was all fake, imagine trying to keep that many people quiet for that long. Yeah, someone would have spilled the beans. Definitely. And the personal and professional risks for those people would have been huge. The likelihood of so many people maintaining a lie like that is just incredibly slim. So it's way more likely that they actually did it. And the Apollo program also led to a lot of technological advancements that we still use today, right? For sure. The program was a huge driver of innovation. The Saturn V rocket is still the most powerful rocket ever built, and the lunar module was an amazing piece of engineering designed to work in space. Yeah. They also created the Apollo Guidance Computer, which was one of the first computers designed for real-time calculations during spaceflight. Those were all groundbreaking inventions, and they led to advancements in computing materials, science, telecommunications, even medical imaging. These are real tangible outcomes, not just some temporary spectacle. So we got a lot more than just bragging rights from the moon landing. And there's even more recent evidence too, right? Like the pictures from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Yes. The LRO was launched in 2009 and it's been taking high resolution photos of the moon. And guess what it found? You can see the landing sites, the equipment left behind by the astronauts, even their footprints preserved in the lunar dust. And some of your sources may have mentioned that amateur astronomers have picked up radio transmissions that match the Apollo missions. It's like the moon itself is providing more and more proof. That's so cool. Okay, but I want to make this even more interesting for our listeners. There were some really fascinating moments and figures from those Apollo missions. What are some highlights? Apollo 11 is obviously legendary with Armstrong's one small step, quote, and they spent over 21 hours on the moon collecting 22 kilos of samples. Right. Then with Apollo 12, they managed to land super close to the Surveyor 3 probe. The astronauts were even able to check it out and bring back some parts so we could see how things hold up in the lunar environment. That's amazing. Then there's Apollo 14, where Alan Shepard hit those golf balls on the moon. I love that story. It's pretty iconic. With Apollo 15, they got to use the lunar rover for the first time and drove almost 28 kilometers. They were really cruising around. They were. Apollo 17 was special because it had Harrison Schmidt, who was a geologist, the only scientist to walk on the moon, and Eugene Cernan was the last human to leave the moon. They also brought back the biggest haul of lunar samples, a whopping 111 kilograms. There's some impressive stats. Yeah. So between all six missions, they brought back 382 kilograms of moon rocks, and that's led to over 10,000 
scientific papers. It's incredible, right? And don't forget, the Saturn V rocket had a perfect success rate for all the lunar flights or the incredible design of the lunar module, which weighed over 15,000 kilograms on Earth, but was engineered for the vacuum and low gravity of the moon. It's mind-blowing. The astronauts' radiation exposure was about the same as a few chest x-rays, and the Apollo 11 landing was watched live by an estimated 600 million people worldwide. Buzz Aldrin described the lunar landscape as magnificent desolation, which I think sums it up perfectly. And it's interesting that even movies like Capricorn One, which is fiction, tapped into this whole debate. It shows how the idea of a moon landing hoax is ingrained in popular culture. It really is. And from a scientific perspective, the Apollo missions completely changed how we understand the moon. They solidified the theory that it was formed from a giant impact. And they taught us so much about how our solar system formed and how to travel in space for longer periods of time. It really was a turning point. So as we wrap up this deep dive, what are the main takeaways for our listeners? Well, for me, the biggest thing is the sheer amount of evidence supporting the fact that the Apollo missions really happened. Those conspiracy theories might seem interesting at first, especially when they focus on specific images or details. But when you look at all the scientific and historical evidence, they just don't hold up. The flag, the stars, the radiation, it, I can all be explained. And then you have the moon rocks, the laser reflectors, all the photos and videos, the confirmation from other countries, the testimonies of everyone involved, and all the tech advancements that came out of the Apollo program. It all points to one conclusion. It seems pretty clear that we did, in fact, reach another world. Right. And it's incredible to think about what other seemingly impossible things future generations will look back on and wonder if they were real. What new frontiers will we explore and what new debates will those explorations spark? That's a really interesting thought to leave everyone with. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the moon landing debate, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and check out XYZ for more deep dives, articles, partner products, and lots more. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. See you next time. Bye. Bye.